This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We continue with part two of our conversation with Detroit Democratic congressional candidate Rashida Tlaib, who's poised to become the first Palestinian-American woman and first Muslim woman to serve in Congress. Tlaib is a democratic socialist who supports the Palestinian right of return and a one-state solution. Rashida Tlaib also supports Medicare for All, a $15 minimum wage, and abolishing ICE, the child of Palestinian immigrants. She's spoken out against the Trump administration's travel bans. Rashida Tlaib, thanks so much for staying with us for this part two of our conversation. What does democratic socialism mean to you? Well, you know, I, I, you have to know this about me. Nermeen probably has seen some of my interviews in the past. I cannot stand these kind of identifiers and just labeling me that. I'm a member of the Michigan Democratic Party, a DSA member, member of the League of Women Voters, ACLU. And why I, I you know, for me, trying to kind of stick me in this box, that's the only thing— I, you know, that's what I am, is, is hard for me to kind of grasp on, because so many of my families throughout the 13th Congressional District just know me as, oh, you're the one that's going to fight for universal health care. You're the one that's going to fight for, uh, you know, pushing back against the cuts towards education and, and uh, trying to get our school district back for some of my uh, folks. And so a lot of my residents, you know, when I start using these various labels and kind of identifiers, and I know people want to do that, it's really difficult. But I can tell you, DSA has been a true partner in fighting back against the corporate tax breaks that I've seen being given away right here in the metro Detroit area, especially to, towards a hockey stadium, Amy and Nermeen, where $400 million that could be going towards schools, uh, many of which are really struggling right now, is going towards an adult playground uh, for a for-profit you know, a billionaire uh, company that sells pizza. Uh, it's absolutely immoral. And that's, I think, that moral compass that myself and Sister Ilhan Omar and I think Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez bring to, you know, bring with us to Congress is going to shift that conversation about, uh, you know, how do we really represent and how do we take care of the people back home? Rashida, you say um, will, it will shift the conversation. Ilhan, Omar, uh, yourself, and uh, Alexandra uh, Ocasio-Cortez, do you think that the Democratic Party is shifting uh, to a more progressive platform? I, you know, seeing Johanna Hayes, you know, Teacher of the Year, having a teacher come onto the House floor with us, it is. It's changing uh, the face of uh, Congress. Not as Democrats or whatever, just the fact that we are women of color, but also women uh, that understand the struggles and challenges that are going on right now back home. Because over half of our colleagues on the House, literally in Congress right now, are millionaires. They're not struggling with uh, class sizes of 45 uh, for their children. They're not struggling on watching our, you know, so many of our parents, you know, having two or three jobs to make ends meet. We hear all of these stories and we, we have so much faith in our public servants in Congress to fight for us. But I think we have to be one of us to be there, you know, for us to really, truly be uh, genuine about it, uh, grounded and rooted into why we're there and why we need to be able to push against this kind of corporate greed that continues to fester in all parts of our government. Uh, and I think that that is what's happening, that shift of, you know, people like us are now running for office. And I think that is transformative. Uh, may it be to Congress, may it be to the party, may it be to the world or to the country. It is going to be a fantastic uh, uh, class of uh, incredible women that walk onto that floor. And I think, yes, it will completely shift the conversation. On that issue of socialism, Rashida Tlaib, a new poll by Gallup shows Democrats now have a more positive view of socialism than capitalism. 57 percent of those polled said they have a positive attitude towards socialism. Just 47 percent said the same about capitalism. What does that say to you? You know, for me, I don't kind of look at those statistics. What I know is when I went door to door, it was around the issues. When I start using labels and start talking about Democratic Party, uh, independent, uh, so many ask me, Rashida, what is a libertarian? They don't know. I mean, for me, my family's in the 13th Congressional District and just know that I'm not going to vote for corporate tax breaks, that I'm going to vote for universal health care, that I'm going to fight for them. They, they know Are you that for I Medicare for all? Absolutely. And explain uh, what that I, means. I say universe, to me, it means being able to have access to everyone having access to health care and having the government play a much important role. But I got to tell you, Amy, I'm not for sitting back and allowing the insurance industry to write the bill. 
And that's one of the biggest criticisms I had about the Affordable Care Act is that it's fine to have the insurance industry be a partner and be part of a work group, but for them to write the majority of that bill, and that's exactly what I heard happened, exactly what I've seen uh, and what I've read about it is that you know, having them being uh, in a much bigger role than they need to be, it has to be led by the people. And what I mean by that is the government needs to take the lead on writing something that gets us closer to universal health care. And Medicare for All gets us closer to a blanket, true access to quality health care that doesn't allow the insurance industry to abuse us to insurance industry to still continue to uh, manipulate this whole process around drug, uh, the drug industry, the prescription drug industry. That to me is, because it has to go hand in hand. Access is important, but I'll tell you, as soon as Affordable Care Act got passed, what I saw with the hardship of having my Detroit police officers who lost their health insurance when we filed bankruptcy in Detroit, to go through that system, I realized it wasn't really true access because the people behind the, that, that door was still the insurance industry who is not putting people first. And we all have to come from that perspective and understanding that that is the fact and that we need to have the government play a much bigger role. Well, Rashida, you mentioned uh, earlier that there are a number of millionaires in, in Congress, uh, the majority yes. of them. Could you elaborate on the class dimensions of this, uh, your own background, and how it's uh, uh, shaped your uh, uh, position on questions like Medicare for all? I mean, there's been so much said about the extent to which money has permeated politics uh, in the U.S. Your mm -hmm. victory suggests that alternatives are possible. They are. They are possible. And I think, you know, the, the hope that I bring is so much needed right now because everything is about pol political strategy and what are the Republicans going to do if we do this or what is the Democrats going to do if we do this? Uh, that is what is the clouds over everything that needs to be done for the people back home. And so I could tell you, coming from a working class, you know, immigrant household, uh, my dad only had fourth grade education, my mother only eighth grade education. My dad's first ever real true job was at Ford Motor Company. Uh, he was a UAW member. And I remember him telling me how, uh, you know, he never got to really vote anywhere. And, and he, you know, he came from Palestine, as nine or 10 years old, went to Nicaragua and found more poverty, more challenges. Um, and then at 19 years old, a young age, to come to the United States of America and his life completely changed. It still was a struggle though. Some days, uh, you know, I remember seeing him, you know, in tears and not knowing really how he was going to be able to take our take care of our family. And I can tell you going through Detroit public schools, growing up in a city that you know, we were probably the punching bag for the nation for so many years. And uh, knowing kind of kind of coming from, again, that lens and that um, experience is, is, is been lacking for so many of us. I remember Congressman Conyers voting against the Patriot Act, voting against the Iraq War when it was unpopular too. That tremendous amount of courage that comes with that kind of leadership. I mean, that's, that's what we need. Uh, and, and I can tell you, no matter what people say about him, he shaped a lot of who I am. I remember after 9-11 him coming to the American Muslim community and the Arab community and having what we call the public forum, standing side by side with us, not being afraid to say they are not at fault and that this is us reacting to, to the fear tactics that are out there and that I'm going to stand by civil rights and equality no matter what. And to me, again, that has shaped my lens. The classism that's happening, I mean, I mean look, I, I can't believe that there's that many. I had no idea that there was such a huge, you know, wealth coming from the members of Congress. Congressman John Dingell told me the balance between corporations was always with Congress. Working class people got to Congress and they always pushed back so there was a balance. Now it seems like the same people that seem to be more sympathetic with corporations are in office versus the real people back home. I want to turn to election night, the night you made history, shortly after you learned you had won the primary. Here, you're standing next to your mother as you speak yes. to supporters. I want you to know my mom, who's from a small village in the West Bank, they're literally glued. It's like 
5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the morning. And now it's more than that. But they're glued to the TV. My grandmother, my aunts, my uncles in Palestine are sitting by and watching their granddaughters. <laughs> district. I'll uplift them every single day being who I am as a proud Palestinian American and woman. Yes! Yes! I what else they need? Them so much because for so many years they How felt dehumanized and I tell you as a Palestinian, I mean, you know, a lot of my strength comes from being Palestinian, Palestinian. but I can tell you my mother's like the compassion this woman has, that isn't me. She smiles every single time. Yeah, she, this woman doesn't even understand when people are being racist to her. <laughs> because she believes that people can be better. And she is an inspiration to me in so many ways. So if you, Rashida, can talk about this moment, you're crying in the studio as you watch yourself standing next. Because I next don't watch it, Amy. If I watch it, Amy and their men, I just start crying. <laughs> You all probably don't even know this. That wasn't really my, you know, that moment. Um, I was just thanking everybody and wanting them to go home and get some rest because we still couldn't call it. It was five in the morning. And I think for me, uh, you know, turning to my right to see my mom in tears and saying to me, I knew you had it. I was like, OK, Ma, <laughs> you know, but I think, uh, uh, you know, seeing her proudly. Uh, look at me and, uh, you know, know exactly what this would mean for the whole country. Uh, we brought light to a moment in darkness for so many people, not only in our country, but around the world. I think American Muslims uh, and Muslims around the world uh, needed a sense of, you know, some, some light, some feeling that, yes, this is exactly why, you know, people need to run and speak up and fight back because of this possibility. The fact that now two Muslim American women are going to be able to walk into the House floor of Congress. What an incredible moment in our country. Celebrate it. Uh, it, it is something uh, that speaks volumes because we can do press conferences, we do marches, we can do protests, and those are so important. But running for office, getting elected in a predominantly non-Muslim community, my sister Ilhan Omar is going to represent 70 percent white community. Uh, and People believed in us. They have faith in us. That is the America I know and love. And I just can't wait uh, to see the faces of so many people saying, and this actually really did happen. You're standing next to your mother. She's covered. She was ululating yeah. <laughs> as, as you were speaking to supporters. You are the eldest of 14 children. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I had my own voting block, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it was an incredible moment for my family. You know, we lost our, my father in December of, uh, of this past year. And so this was just even more sweeter, uh, just because this is the man who, when we turned 18, he didn't say happy birthday. He said, go register to vote <laughs> because that's what the UAW taught him. Uh, I think, you know, at that moment, my mom was elated. Uh, she had already four days before, Tuesday, you know, the Tuesday elections had dry cleaned my Palestinian, the Palestinian thob that she's going to have me wear when I swear on the Holy Quran. And so she already had so much faith and belief. I'm just so glad we won because I, I, you know, she's a person that would say, continue to smile and say, you know what, it was written, there was a reason, but uh, she's elated. She's so happy. And I can tell you, uh, she keeps saying to me, uh, and you got to meet her and understand where, how I grew up the way I am. She says to me, listen, don't bother him too much. Let God handle him. And I was like, okay, mom. You know, and she's talking about President Trump. And so this is the woman I'm, I'm, I'm completely surrounded by constantly, uh, so humbled, so, so pure uh, in, that, in that she truly believes in a higher spirit. She truly believes things happen for a reason. And she, everything that she sees is through this just amazing empathy. Like she, her compassion comes so strongly uh, in me. Uh, but she is, she's ready. She said, don't get that thob dirty. I was like, mom, it's in the closet. It's, everything's fine. Uh, we're ready to roll when, when it's time uh, in January.
Well, Rashida, you also said in the uh, uh, New York Times interview that you often thank God uh, uh, for your victory and, and successes in, in political life, uh, but that for you, uh, Allah is a she. Yes, Allah is a she. And you know, there's 99 names for Allah, attributes, and 50 percent of those are feminine. And so in my campaign team, I remember, you know, almost missing flights and all these things. And there was a, another um, amazing girl in my office named Amira, who's also Palestinian. And she she would say, it's just, oh, I can't believe you made it. And I was like, because she's on our side. And she's like, who is she? And I said, that's Allah. And she goes, Allah is a she for you? I said, absolutely. And she goes... Oh, and I was like, well, you know, Allah's not have, supposed to have, you know, a gen it's not gender, you know, specific. And, you know, that's the point. But, you know, if the men can say he, I can say she. Mm. Um, can you talk about the president of the United States, as many are calling the sexual harasser in chief, uh, sexual mm. predator in chief? So many women before the election, uh, when you were protesting him there in Detroit as a candidate, had come out and said he had sexually abused them, harassed them, sexually assaulted them. Um, can you talk about what that means um, for the president to be um, accused of this by so many women and your own life experiences? It just means we have a lot of work to do, Amy. I can't um, fathom, you know, this is a president of the United States that I probably wouldn't want meeting my sisters or my mother. Right. I mean, this is because the lack of, you know, true meaning and understanding of what it means to abuse a woman, uh, the meaning of what those actions really mean to, you know, women, young women that are seeing that the president of the United States is allowed to do that and not be held accountable, that I hope that that doesn't make them more silent. It's so dangerous that so many people don't understand the true um, slippery slope of just true, just toxicity and danger that it brings to a young woman who's starting her first job, like I did, you know, my first job outside of college was at a civil rights organization. And I could have never imagined, you know, I didn't really even understand what sexual harassment was until it happened to me. And it was five months of pure, just agony, me wearing turtlenecks and sweaters uh, in the middle of summer because I was worried he would touch me again, uh, worried that he would make remarks to me again. And again, this young, you know, now I'm so much more stronger and so much more knowledgeable. And every time a young woman comes to me and says she experienced that, I look at her and I said, grow stronger. Look what I, where I am. Look what I've been able to do. Build off of that. But to have the president of the United States to be let off as if this is OK, that this is some sort of norm is so dangerous for our daughters, for our sisters, for our mothers that are in the workplace now, that are in the world and experiencing this now. I hope that they don't see this as a form of you have to be quiet about it and be silent because there's no justice at the end. There is justice. We, he will, uh, if it's through my mother's path of just allowing the higher being take care of him, or is it going to be fighting harder and working harder and out? Um, uh, you know, just outworking that kind of toxicity that is now in the White House. Do you believe uh, President Trump should be impeached, and I want to be able Rashida? To uplift them all through my own personal experiences Rashida, and say what the president stands for is completely wrong. Rashida Tlaib, do you think President Trump should be impeached? Yes. So you'd be part of that effort in Congress? Absolutely. Have you ever watched Law and Order? Yes. You know, the first part is the crime and then the arrest happens? And then the second half is the accountability of true like investigation of whether or not whether or not that person committed the crime. I'm really good at the second half of Law and Order, so I'll be the part a partner for any U.S. senator that needs me to you know uh, be a partner in collecting information, collecting the, uh, what I know already is that President uh, Trump has probably violated a number of criminal acts, uh, especially when it comes to the relationship with Russia. Do you think Nancy Pelosi should be House Speaker? I think this is a time for a new era of, you know, a new generation, uh, just because I just truly believe this is a new era of civil rights movement that uh, we are all part of. And there is a moment now where I think true leadership is realizing that getting us to this point 
is was so important. And I, I got to tell you, I mean, Leader Pelosi is an incredible um, person and has done an incredible job. But at some point, we have to make decisions on whether or not we want to be able to get someone there that can speak to the various challenges and issues of my families back home in the 13th Congressional District. That They're my priority. And right now, the stance around Dodd, you know, Frank, the stance around a number of issues are troubling for me. And so that's why I have been very much uh, saying that probably not. Um, I haven't spoken to Leader Pelosi. I, um, you know, don't want to use this as, you know, giving you uh, uh, some general generic response. I can tell you I, I most likely want to lean towards someone that will uh, be more in line with the civil rights issues of my district. Well, the Democratic National Committee uh, has been facing criticism from climate activists after the DNC essentially lifted a ban on fossil fuel company donations. Right. DNC chair Tom Perez introduced the measure, saying the party wants to, quote, support fossil fuel workers. Uh, so could you comment on that, Rashida, in the context of, of what you said, having a new uh, leadership within the Democratic Party and your own position uh, uh, on climate change and what the U.S. needs to be doing? Absolutely. It's a great example, Neil Man. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, jobs don't fix cancer. They don't fix the environment. And this whole, um, you know, argument constantly, to me, misleads the American people when you say this is about jobs. Either you're for ending Citizens United or you're not. So if you're for ending Citizens United, then act like you are against corporations influencing our democratic process. So lifting that ban on, on accepting donations from fossil fuel companies, uh, to me, that action spoke more than any press release or statement that's coming out of DNC. I mean, that, to me, says that those issues are not priority. Uh, and, and they can be strategic about how, why, and all these other things. But at the same time, you know, my father had two forms of cancer. I can tell you, living in a community where we're surrounded by industry, I actually thought that smell was normal in Southwest Detroit, where I lived less than half a mile from Marathon Oil Refinery. The only petroleum refinery in the state of Michigan was is right in my neighborhood. And so all of those, you know, all of that to say that I'm very disturbed by it. I was disappointed. And I don't feel like we're moving forward. We're just moving backward uh, with that decision. Rashida Tlaib, what does it mean to call for the abolition of ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement? Yes. You know that I'm, I'm in a border community. So people don't always think of the southern border. They don't think about the northern border. And Detroit has is, is got an international border right there. And when you come across that uh, crossing, you have 20 different ethnicities. Majority my, uh, majority of my neighbors are Latino. And all I've seen is ICE militarizing our neighborhoods, going around, like literally traveling, patrolling them around, around the neighborhoods inside residential areas. You know, it's not local police. This is, this is literally what we call, we call them sometimes the blue guys uh, because of the, of the color of the uniform. But that kind of militarization and kind of, to me, um, uh, uh, targeting of American people, of my immigrant neighbors, that to me alone, that just the fact that that is happening says to me that ICE is not for border border security. ICE is moving us towards a more militarized approach towards Americans and towards American land uh, versus us really being feeling safe. I've seen ICE do operations in front of schools, picking up parents after they drop off their children. I spoke up against it years ago about the fact that ICE is not uh, as, in, as it was supposedly intended. It is actually going beyond the border uh, security and actually targeting and, and terrorizing families right here at home. And so for me, it's very personal. I don't want to see my family scared of its own government. I don't want my families worried about what's going to happen after they drop their child off at school. You know, they're not supposed to be doing operations near churches, and they are. They're parking in the parking lot of churches. Pa actual Catholic priests have called me saying, Rashida, I don't know what to do. None of my immigrant families want to come to church because it was Wednesday night, and they don't want to come to Bible study because there's a border, there's an ICE kind of agent or, or police vehicle in the parking lot. That kind of intimidation and targeting of people is completely wrong. And I can't wait to be able to vote to abolish ICE.
And Rashida, you've also been uh, extremely uh, vocal in your criticism of uh, uh, Trump's various iterations of, of, of the travel ban. Could mm -hmm. you uh, talk about that also in the context of, of Ilhan uh, Omar? And, and what about the fact that Muslim Americans are running on a progressive platform uh, during the time uh, of Trump, especially since Muslims are not, Muslims in America, are not associated with a, a progressive platform? I'd just like to turn to a short clip of Ilhan Omar's uh, acceptance speech. In my last race, I talked about what my win would have meant for that eight-year-old girl in that refugee camp. Yes. And today, yes. today I still think about her. And I think about the kind of hope and optimism that all of those eight-year-olds around the country yes. and around the world get from seeing your beautiful faces elect and believe in someone like me. So that's uh, Ilhan Omar uh, Rashida, who, along with you, is poised to become uh, the first, uh, of, including you, two Muslim women in Congress. So again, if you, if you could comment uh, uh, on that, uh, Muslims running on a progressive platform and the significance of this. You know, I talk about uh, Trump being in office kind of the bat signal for women to run, uh, that we wait until we're really needed and we jump. I think what I saw years ago when the anti-immigrant sentiment was so much of a high rise, I mean, looking at the different, you know, English only bills and trying to um, legislate immigration through state law, I saw hundreds and hundreds of Latino candidates rise up uh, and file, you know, file to run. And I see that with the Muslim community. What I love about this moment and the, and the fact that our country, every time we get kind of pushed down and we feel like there's no hope, I think there's so many at home that we all mourned when uh, President Trump won, really, truly mourned. Uh, and I think many could have just stayed home and did nothing. But I think Latinos, women of color, uh, 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 my Muslim brothers and sisters, they're all deciding to run for office and to actually not stay outside of the ring and be quiet, but actually get inside the ring and fight back. And that's what it all means. But Ilhan Omar and myself, for the experiences that we all went through, I mean, and it wasn't Muslims that elected us. It was non-Muslims. That is a huge, again, inspirational, powerful message. And I feel like this, you know, people call it the blue wave and the pink wave and the Muslim wave. It's this rainbow that is like coming to, to Congress, literally, from my trans sister that is getting like, I mean, all of the people that are running are just incredible array of what we really love about our country and the, and the beauty of our country. And I, I can't wait uh, to hold, hold her hand as we walk uh, through the halls of Congress. She brings so much courage. I was like, please don't let me be the only one, Elhan. And she's like, I got it. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm thrilled um, that uh, Congresswoman-elect or candidate uh, Omar will be joining me. And on the issue of Yemen, the worst yeah. humanitarian catastrophe in the world today. Uh, you have the U.S. backing the Saudi-led coalition that is bombing Yemen back to the Stone Ages. The most recent bombing, where the U.S. bomb killed 40 school children, 51 people altogether. Um, Congress has introduced a bill, some members of Congress, uh, to end the military support for Saudi Arabia. Where do you stand on this issue? What should be done about Yemen with, oh, over a million Yemenis uh, have cholera. So many are facing starvation. Many have died of hunger. I think uh, for many of us here back home, the 13th Congressional District, we have a huge population of Yemeni American families. I mean, their, their family members are still there. I'm going to come from a place of humanity, and that means not allowing children to starve not allowing to support any military action by any government that targets innocent people. I'm, you know, it doesn't work, and it will never work for us to approach this from a military stance. We are really losing just the humanity of what it really means. The generation of children there, we can never get the years back. We can never help um, ease or heal uh, the pain that comes with war and with bombings and killings. Uh, all I can tell you is that I will try my best to make sure people understand what the human cost and the human impact is of that kind of support.
And finally, your name, Rashida. Um, as you won, made history in your primary, because you now run unopposed, and we want to know what that means. What do you do until November if you're running unopposed um, for the congressional seat that was held by Congressman Conyers? Um, your name is spelled T-L-A-I-B, and I could see hosts around the network struggling with this name. Is it Tlaib? Is it— um, Talk about the origins of your name. It's spelled well, Tlaib, but you pronounce it Tlaib? Well, it's actually uh, pronounced as if it was in Hebrew. So when it got translated, it got translated in, in the Hebrew language instead of Tlaib, which is supposed to be T-A-L-E-E-B, instead of Tlaib. Um, but we are from, you know, what we call in, in Palestine, Dar Talib. Uh, and Talib uh, is my name, uh, even though the, it would have, it would have, I think uh, I heard it would have took months for us to get the new translation and we didn't have that time. So we ended up with that spelling. Trust me, my two boys are still <laughs> struggling <laughs> to understand why their names are spelled that way. But I, you know, the irony of it, I mean, the fact that uh, it, it, is, it is spelled as if it was pronounced in Hebrew. Uh, and I could tell you Rashida, which means wise uh, in Arabic, but it also, it, I was named after my great aunt who helped raise my father in Nicaragua. In Nicaragua? Yes. Yeah. Explain that connection. Oh, no. So my father, um, when he was about nine or 10 years old from Jerusalem, went to Nicaragua. Uh, my grandmother took her children to Nicaragua, hoping for a better life, and found more poverty. And uh, when he was 19, he finally came into the United States uh, from Nicaragua. But yeah, there's that connection there. I think a lot of people don't understand that when—and Pal Palestinians are all over. Uh, we're kind of—you know, I heard there's a huge population even in Cuba. Uh, we're, we're, we've, you know, the displacement and what war does is we're all over the place. And I see it now with— Families from Syria, hearing that they're now in Germany and in all parts of Europe and even in South America, I think that is, um, you know, part of what happens with uh, with war. And as you talk about the diaspora, um, the right of return that you support, can you explain what it is? Uh, you know, these are family members that, um, when they left, they they actually took their keys to their house. Uh, thinking in 1967, I know my family, uh, my uncle, my great uncles and everyone packed their children, everything that they could just needed for a few months. And they took their key to their home and left, thinking they were going to be able to come back. Uh, and uh, when they realized they couldn't, I mean, they still even have the keys were so big. I, I remember my uh, uh, uncle um, uh, Musa in Jordan. He went to Jordan and he, he showed me the key, like he still had the keys in his hands, thinking he was going to be able to come back to his homeland. And why can't he? He can't because they forbid it. Um, the kind of, um, I think, uh, policies that are in place now is to keep as many people out uh, that left uh, through 48 and 67. They were uprooted uh, and they, you know, they weren't allowed to obviously come back. And that's that's what happens when there's, um, you know, again, a, a whole people coming and saying, you don't belong here, you need to leave. Uh, I mean, we did it to Native Americans. So this is not new, but it's also still wrong, and that doesn't change the fact that it's done, been done before. And what does the Israeli government have to do to allow the right of return? What would that mean? I mean, that would mean acknowledging some sort of process. I mean, I think there are organizations like J Street who support uh, a combination of some sort of right re of return. Uh, and that, that means uh, the possibility of saying, look, you have a right to come, but if you don't, there's rep you know, we'll be able to maybe um, uh, uh, some sort of financial uh, mitigation, uh, anything of that sort. But the, even just to be allowed to make that decision at this point, I mean, it's been uh, decades. Uh, but even to be able to say they can come and visit, they can come and uh, so many can't even come and visit, uh, even go to the Dome of the Rock to visit Jerusalem again, uh, to even just come and see where they grew up, uh, see where uh, they came from. Uh, I think that is wrong, but it, it means them changing the policy of accessibility and freedom to be able to make that decision and come and, and decide whether or not they want to live where they were born. Well, Rashida, very quickly before we conclude, where do you hope the Democratic Party will go on questions of American foreign policy? I think, you know, what I want them to do is use it as leverage. 
I think we so easily give out, um, you know, aid and, and, you know, this kind of partnership that we offer through aid. Uh, that we 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 do it based on closed door you know agreements, uh, based on something we might Americans don't even really truly understand. But I think we need to use it as leverage. We give out so much and we get back so little. Uh, what I mean by that is give we don't get back a respect from some of those countries. Uh, we don't get back this true partnership of understanding real true equality and justice for all. Uh, I think it actually hurts us and hurts our reputation to the citizenry that has to uh, really take the burden of that aid. I mean, many of that, many of those countries use that aid to oppress people and to target people. And that's when we have to step up and say, look, we're, we're going to be able, and we do it to states all the time. The federal government says to states, you have to do certain things before we actually give you aid for roads and for different kinds of uh, services. You know, you can't discriminate. You can't uh, violate someone's right. We do it to states all the time. We need to do the same thing to, to foreign countries. Uh, we can't sit back and just give it out freely without using it as leverage to promote peace and to promote true, real justice for all. Well, we want to thank you so much for being with us, Rashida Tlaib, um, poised to be the first Palestinian-American woman and the first Muslim woman elected to Congress. Last week, she won the Democratic primary for John Conyers' old House seat in Detroit, Michigan. To see part one of our conversation, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thanks so much for joining us.